Tonight on Creepy Canada, the brutal history of an Ottawa prison, tales of murder in Hudson, Quebec, flaming ghost ships in Mahone Bay, and more. two centuries, a strange phenomena has been occurring on Mahone Bay. Sightings of a ghost ship burning. People claim it to be the Young Teaser, a privateer ship that burned in the harbor. The Young Teaser was an American privateer. A privateer was a licensed pirate, a vessel given permission to hunt enemy ships for capture. The Young Teaser was a two-masted schooner. She was built specifically for privateering. She had uh, two spires of Norway pine. She was built of American oak. Uh, she was lined with cork in order to prevent the splinters from the uh, broadsides coming in and hurting the crew. Uh, she had five guns on board. She was fast, meant to be a rapid raider. She came to Nova Scotia shores during the War of 1812 coming here in June, 1813. Her captain was William Dobson, and when she arrived in the waters off Lindenburg and into the Mahone Bay, she had a crew of 26 on board. That particular morning, the people from Lindenburg watched with great care as they saw the two ships coming across the bay. They were worried because some years before, the town had been raided by privateers, and this might mean another raid. As they watched the events of the day unfold, the American privateer was cornered in the Mahone Bay by two British warships, one the frigate Orpheus, and the other a ship of the line, a three-decker named La Hogue. Johnson gave his word that he would not again take up arms against the British. And if he were caught on the young teaser, then the punishment for him was hanging. And they were hoping under the cover of darkness to slip out of the bay between Tancock and the Blandford shore. However, that was not to be for La Hogue lowered five of her boats away, and they began rowing toward the teaser. As the teaser's crew saw the, the British ships coming, one in particular watched with great anxiety. Frederick Johnson had been the lieutenant of the teaser. So he, more nervous than the others, went into the galley of the teaser and took a coal from the stove and ran forward and threw it into the magazine. The powder magazine exploded and the ship burned into the night. Residents were horrified to see such a sight. It was shortly after this that residents sighted the young teaser burning in the home base. Rescue ships were launched. However, when they arrived on the scene, the teaser was gone. There is a phenomenon called St. Elmo's fire. When there's electrically charged clouds, 
uh, there can be what appears to be fire around the mast of a sailing ship. So that could certainly lead to these stories. And that's a natural event. The fact that there are fewer sightings now than there were in the past, I think is highly indicative that perhaps what people did see up till the 1930s could have been the St. Elmo's fire because they had tall masted uh, vessels up until about the 30s. Then after that, you know, yachts and different kinds of fishing boats. Most people in that area know the story of the pirate ship, which certainly has an air of uh, infamy and adventure, etc. Uh, it could lead to these stories. When this ghost ship appears, people claim to see men standing on deck engulfed in flames. Could this be the crew of the young teaser, a group of men sentenced to death by a young lieutenant who wanted to avoid his own hanging? Many claim it to be the truth. What a selfish man, this young lieutenant, commander of this ship, knowing that his own life would be taken, and yet he decided that everyone would die if he was going to. No wonder the young teaser appears burning on the horizon and the crew standing engulfed in flames to this day. In 1939, my parents were walking along the western shore of the Mahone Bay and noticed a ship on fire on the June evening. They thought it was a pulp boat hauling pulpwood out of the mouth of the Gold River. And they stopped along with others and watched for 15 minutes or so. And some people prepared to launch a dory and row out to see if they could be of assistance. And all of a sudden, there was just like a great explosion, but not a sound. And the whole apparition disappeared. When we had moved to Cheston, we knew the story of the teaser. And... Uh, we were uh, out for uh, an evening stroll, probably uh, close to dusk, around 8 o'clock in the evening. And we were just coming down around the foot of King Street in Chester by the Yacht Club. And uh, my husband said, uh, look, look out there. Round Island there, there's something burning, and we stopped, and we looked at it. First of all, we thought it was an island uh, burning, or somebody burning bush or something, and, and uh, then we both realized it was a shape of a, of a boat. Shape of a schooner. So when uh, we watched it for a little while, we even knocked on neighbors' doors and got them to come out and confirm the fact that what we were seeing was what they could see. So. It was kind of, a, that's why it was such a thrill to think that there it was, there's the, the famous teaser. We watched it for about 20 minutes and we called friends to take a look and uh, they saw the same thing that we did. In fact, they said that they'd been out in the whaler the next morning to see if they could find some remnants of, of burning, like some uh, field on fire. Or, uh, they could find no evidence at all. It would seem that the crew of the young teaser have decided in goodwill to save other people's lives. The young teaser is sighted often when a ship is lost at sea. Lost ships follow this light to the safety of the shore. day, people report seeing a burning ship on the waters of the Mahone Bay. It flares and burns at a distance. By the time that people go to investigate, the ship has vanished. There's no evidence of fire anywhere. And they have seen the ghost of the American privateer, Young Teaser. The Young Teaser continues to be an enduring story in the hearts of those residents along the home bay. Each year, they build a replica of the Young Teaser, hold a celebration, and set the ship on fire. 
It's a story that is being kept alive and may continue for the next 200 years. Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario and Hudson, Quebec. Two beautiful, peaceful inns, but some guests who check out never leave. Tales of heartbreak and murder, next on Creepy Canada. Niagara on the Lake has been called the prettiest town in Canada. It is also the most haunted. During the War of 1812-1814, the town was invaded a number of times by American forces. American forces burned this town, many died, and their ghosts still linger to this day. People may not realize that General Isaac Brock had a love in his life. She was a lady. Indeed, Lady Sophie. Her family was well known and carried a title. However, General Isaac Brock, although well respected and fairly wealthy, was not the proper suitor. They met secretly, and during those times, you can only imagine the conversation they had. What would they do? Where would they go? Together they planned their future. Engaged to be married, it would all change on that fateful day during the War of 1812. On October the 13th, 1812, the American forces invaded Canada. General Isaac Brock, leaving Fort George with his forces, met the Americans at Queenston Heights. Brock led a charge up the hill. An American sharpshooter caught him in his sights. He fell mortally wounded. Still, he struggled to lead his men. Unfortunately, Brock died before he could see that victory of the day. Lady Sophie was devastated by the news of General Brock. For the rest of her life, she lived in seclusion. She was never to marry or look at another man. General Isaac Brock was the man of her life and her dreams. Brockamore, where they had met and planned their life secretly, would be the last place on this earth that Lady Sophie would ever enjoy happiness. Each year, thousands of Canadians aspire to find some secluded, isolated destination to travel to. Everyone needs a little peace and tranquility in their lives. And Canadians these days seek out these beautiful local inns to stay in and enjoy the historic countryside while they're there. But few realize all the unseen spirits that are walking down sidewalks, looking out windows, and occupying rooms in the local inns. Historic Brockmore is haunted by two spirits. One is Sophia Shaw, and the other one is General Brock. And the two are there because they were lovers. And to this day, they are both still there, talking, walking, possibly strolling down the hallway together. The Brockamore legend is a great story for generating a ghost story because it's got passion in it, it's got romance, it's got sadness, the whole thing. Now, this occurs in an old house. Again, lots of opportunity for strange sounds, lots of opportunity for imaginations to play tricks on us. And so if you go there knowing that legend, and if you happen to be suggestible, and especially if you would like to believe that because of all the passion and sadness and so forth involved, it, it leaves your mind like a canvas to be painted on by your imagination. You know, the sounds and the, the, the images and so forth of this old house can easily be combined in the, in the suggested mind to be the sound of, of Isaac Brock or the sound of his girlfriend. Or if you see a shadow walking across the rose garden, it's easy for our brains to interpret that as a person. And what person would it be? It would probably be one of those two because you've already decided it's a ghost. So it's very easy for our brains to fill out all the details 
based on number one, expectation, number two, suggestibility, number three, a few ambiguous stimuli sounds, lights, and so forth around the premises. Other guests report hearing music coming from the top of the stairs. It's not uncommon as well to hear doors opening and closing at night and mumbled voices coming from the hallway. Some people go there looking for ghosts. Some people go there anxious that they might see one. They don't want to see one. But anxiety and expectation together make it more likely that you'll interpret ambiguous stimuli in terms of the stories that you've heard. So it's not surprising that of all the people that, that move through a town like that every year, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, some will, in fact, go away saying they saw or heard ghosts. Today, guests staying at Brockamore have several paranormal experiences there. For example, a spirit is seen, people feel a presence there. One female guest recently staying in Lady Sophie's suite felt as if she was being followed. She was awakened to find a figure standing at the end of the bed. It was a woman wearing a long gown with brown hair. And indeed, it was Lady Sophie, looking at her with disapproval. It would seem that Lady Sophie is very jealous about another woman in her home called Brockamore. There's an interesting period of sleep. It's called hypnagogic sleep, which happens just between being awake and being deeply asleep, where in fact our brains can't tell the difference between what's in our imaginations and what's real outside. Our brain in that phase of sleep can't tell the difference between things it perceives from inside the brain and things that are outside the brain. It thinks it's awake. It's not fully awake. It's, it's confusing reality and fantasy it will seem to you the next morning as having been real. You'll remember having wakened up, having seen a, a ghost walking through your room or whatever, and it will just seem as real as anything that happened to you the day before. Your brain will not recognize it as having been a dream, having been this hypnagogic imagery. It would seem that Brockamore also has another ghostly figure appearing at night, and that would be Isaac Brock. People see him wearing a red uniform. Although he's fairly elusive, it's like a quick shadow that goes by out of the corner of your eye. Although Brock has been sighted alone in the dining room area or near Lady Sophie's suite, on occasion, and a rare occasion, they're seen together. If you see General Isaac Brock and Lady Sophie walking the halls of Brockamore, you might want to give them a little space. After all, they had so little when they were alive. And they really do deserve it, don't you think? People wishing to experience historic Lower Canada might want to go to the Willow Inn in Hudson, Quebec. Every detail of this historic inn is well preserved, including an original staff member named Maud. The spirit of Maud died a bloody death in this inn. It was the 1830s. She was a loyalist to the British government, and patriots were talking about an uprising. My name is Mike Dobie. I'm the owner of the Willow Inn here in Hudson, Quebec, and have been since 1982 when I purchased the inn at that time. Maud Kirkbride was a servant here at the Willow when it was a boarding house, when it was owned by Francois Xavier Desjardins. Mr. Desjardins was a sympathizer with the Patriots who were about to start a rebellion in this part of the country. Maud was well aware that the owner of the inn leaned towards the Patriots, and in the basement, was the answer, guns, ammunition. Maude felt compelled to report this owner to the government. And as a result, Maude put her life in jeopardy. Willow was subsequently raided by the militia here. All the weapons were confiscated. That put an end to that part of the rebellion as far as the help coming from this side of the river. The Patriots weren't happy with Maud's actions. Revenge was the key word. Late one night, they crept 
down the hallway of the Willow Inn. Maud heard a noise. She went out to investigate. And then she was brutally stabbed to death by the Patriots. She was left there to die. The murder was never solved, and uh, there was, no one was ever brought to justice for, for the murder. As a result, her spirit remains here today. An untimely death is one very good reason for a spirit to remain behind. And Maud may feel that she needs some form of revenge. Shortly after taking, uh, taking over the Willow, uh, the first summer, um, we had a number of different guests staying here. One guest who was staying in room six experienced Maud's spirit. She heard some noises out the door, and she also felt a presence in the room. And that was Maud. The woman decided to follow the noises in the hallway. As she entered the hallway, she felt a cold touch on her shoulder. The guest was so uncomfortable feeling a presence like she was being followed in the inn. She went to the management to complain. She was quite disturbed about it. She was even more disturbed when she was told the story about the ghost, which she wasn't previously aware of. She was quite angry. She wanted that information before she ever got booked into room six. Room six seems to be the center of activity in Willow Inn. But there's another odd slant to this story, and that is a wheelchair that seems to take on its own personality. For a time during Maud's life, she was confined to this wheelchair. The wheelchair's been there since 1830. People sense a presence around this wheelchair. The wheelchair has been here forever. I have speaking to the past three owners of the Willow going way back, and the wheelchair was here. It seemed to be a part of the Willow, and they are pretty sure that it was Maud's wheelchair at the time. In the fire of 1989, the wheelchair was up in one of the rooms. It was just used as more as decoration and to, to keep the folklore alive, and that room was gutted. The beds were burned. Everything was burned in the room except the wheelchair, and the wheelchair didn't have a mark on it. It is not uncommon to hear stories about objects being possessed by a spirit, for example, a lamp or a mirror. Often a spirit is attached to these objects. So unless the object is buried with that individual, there'll continue to be activity around it. One guest who had stayed at the end had the ability of second sight. He might not have been aware of it at the time, but he felt something or someone trying to communicate with him. He was also booked into room six. The wheelchair, well, he was drawn to it in some ways. He knew there was something going on with that chair. Our guest dozed off for a time in room six, and when he awakened, the wheelchair had moved on its own and was much closer to him. The wheelchair has a presence of its own, and we know that because the wheelchair has the ability to move around all by itself. And a number of times, this wheelchair has been found in other parts of this historic inn. Guests have also stated that they've seen white orbs of light floating around this wheelchair. 
it is quite possible that the orbs of light are somehow attached to Maud's spirit. Over the years, speaking to families that had relatives here in the early 1900s, the stories were prevalent of Maud, who was still uh, here and haunting the willow. Maud is still at the Willow Inn in Hudson, Quebec, because she may feel her death still needs to be avenged. The men who murdered her went free, and Maud needs to be freed herself. To her, the year is still 1830, not the year 2002. Throughout Canada, we have many of these historic inns that are haunted from General Isaac Brock and Lady Sophie to Maud, the servant in Willow Inn. These spirits in these historic dwellings remain forever imprisoned in their world. Coming up on Creepy Canada, falsely imprisoned men, women, and children now haunt the notorious prison in Ottawa, Ontario, where they lived out their last hellish days. County Jail was built in 1862 to house criminals in the Ottawa district. Anybody could be prisoned here. There was women, there was children, families, hardened criminals, people who owed money. There was public hangings, torture cells, there was a lot of death, a lot of disease. It's different things that are even unthinkable today. Guards could actually torture or hurt prisoners should they want to. The inhumane living conditions solitary confinement cells, which just wasn't a prison that anybody would want to stay in. This was more like hell on earth. A Carleton County Jail is haunted. It's probably one of the most haunted buildings in Canada. This jail is littered with spirits. People have numerous experiences that are staying in this jail today that's now a youth hostel. Housed in this prison were many different types of prisoners. You had murderers alongside petty thieves. Even children were housed here. Children were placed in jail as a result of theft, and often when families didn't pay their debts, the whole family was incarcerated in the jail. I mean, there's a lot of stories about um, people hearing children crying, people hearing children speaking, um, maybe songs, stories, things like that. The need to have a women's prison solely in this prison was needed, so they converted the ninth floor, which was once for a couple years the hospital, into a women's prison. The majority of the women staying there were prostitutes being taken off the streets and put into this prison. Some people believe that the legacy of all this human suffering still remains within the prison today. Some people even believe that it may be haunted as a result of all the different things that happened here. This place actually had a number of different things happening in the, ha in the prison all the time. Even public hangings happened here. Canadians have always been fascinated with crime. And at one time, thousands would participate by attending public hangings in this country. One of the most famous people who were hanged at the jail was Patrick Whalen. And Patrick Whalen was accused of murdering Thomas Darcy McGee, one of the fathers of Confederation. And Patrick Whalen, when he was hanged on February the 11th, on the 11th hour of 1869, 5,000 people watched Patrick Whalen swing. So, believe it or not, Patrick Whalen believes he was innocent, and that's why he stays there. Okay, this is death row, and this cell just here is a cell where Mr. Patrick James Whalen spent 10 months awaiting his execution along with his own personal guard, Mr. John Lyle. On the day of his execution, he would be taken out of here and accompanied with his guard and the prison warden and a clergyman all the way down to the gallows, taking what we call the walk of death. Uh, when you get down to the gallows, you'll stand in front of the trap door and this priest will read you your last rites. On the words, may God have mercy on your soul, you'll step back onto the trap door and hang to your death. Mr. Whalen did not actually hang on these words. He hung on his own personal speech, which, uh, which goes something along the lines of, uh, I forgive all those who have wronged me, I forgive all those I have wronged. God save Ireland and God save my soul. And on those words, he stepped back and hung to his death.
but we also have a number of sightings of Mr. Patrick James Whalen. People staying in here say they either had someone walk straight through the bars or open the door and come and, uh, come and talk to them. Uh, the description we take always matches that of Mr. Patrick James Whalen. Uh, the reason that Mr. Patrick James Whalen uh, haunts the place, they say, is that uh, firstly, the date he was hung. He was hung at 11 o'clock on the 11th of February, 1869. Superstition dictates that you are to be hung at the 13th hour of the 13th day of the month. Therefore, Whalen was two hours and two days too early. Such was uh, their haste to get over and done with. Secondly, he was buried with his noose around his neck, uh, something that, again, superstition dictates is not to happen as the noose is to be burnt. Thirdly, he is buried on, on uh, prison property, which is now hostile property. And keep in mind, those that were hanged, they were not allowed to be buried in a holy cemetery. There has been stories that people say they see a figure in the cell. Some people say that they think it's another hostel or somebody staying here until he walks through the bars. And then they go, oh, what was that? If I said to you, uh, I, I saw a man, he had a big plumed hat on, big feathers sticking out the end, and he had a sword at his side, and he had, he had funny little shoes, and you say, gosh, Christopher Columbus haunts this place. You've described Prince, Prince Christopher Columbus. People would say, yeah, big hat with a... I don't know what Christopher Columbus looked like. But, but all you need to do is mention a few things that would suit a, a, a person that you're looking for and it will match. So uh, what is the match for a prisoner who's hung there? What do you say? He's short? He's tall? Uh, he's got a mustache? Y you know, out of 10 or 12 things you say, maybe only two or three of them match, but they'd match a whole bunch of people. But it's very easy for people to say, oh, this is a direct hit. Yeah, I find when I walk on death row, you know that feeling you get with the piglies on the back of your neck? I always get that. People report having felt cold spots here. They say the cells are colder, some areas are colder. I find this whole floor to be a lot colder. The prison gets quite warm, but for some reason, death row is always much colder than the rest of the place. In 1862, I'm sure you can imagine that the medical field wasn't nearly as advanced, and disease inside of the prison was rampant. Epidemics flew through here like never before, and downstairs in the basement was the quarantine. Funny enough, it's actually right next to the prison kitchen. It was in this area that uh, anybody suffering from a disease that could be contagious was sent down. They were usually sent there to live out their final days before dying of whatever disease they had. When they built the bridge next door uh, to the hostel, they actually found mass burial sites. Hundreds of people thrown into a pit. It was believed, or it was said, People from the prison, anybody who died here, they might be just wrapped in a blanket and thrown into this pit. One of the reasons that they think the hauntings occur here is actually because of these mass burial sites out in the back courtyard. The injustice of it all to so many people. Next door to the hostel, there's a courthouse. And it was in that courthouse that prisoners would have been sentenced to whatever they were sentenced to. They'd be brought underground and up by the solitary confinement cells. This was done on purpose. The prison was designed so that anybody entering the prison would have to see the kind of torture that other prisoners endured. It was a warning sign. You misbehave, you'll end up in the solitary confinement cells. They have an area in the jail they called the hole. And this is where prisoners would ta be taken for six months at a time. And even when you tour the hole to this day, you can see little etchings on the floor where they had grabbed something in order to make a mark on the floor of the prisoners. And many of them died in the hole. And uh, to go into the hole yourself today is quite an eerie experience. Downstairs in the solitary confinement cell, I know that I almost always feel that there's somebody always behind me. And I, I do quick looks behind me to see who's there, and there's never anybody there. Other people say that they've seen people, that they've heard footsteps. That whole area downstairs, people have said they hear screams, that they hear crying, anything like that, doors being slammed. All sorts of crazy things happen down there. I don't think a particular age group, such as older teenagers, would be any more susceptible than adults. Of course, younger teenagers and children are much more susceptible to their imaginations and to suggestibility. But if you, if you take the group that's going through the Ottawa Youth Hostel, they're probably, most of them are late teens. Now, they, they may be more susceptible, not because of their age, but because of, of their outlook on the world. Many people who stay in youth hostels are are trying to seek adventure and, and opening all kinds of doors to different belief systems. And that may make them more susceptible. They may be more rejecting of sort of the, the conservative approach to the world that everything can be explained normally and they're interested in finding all kinds of new levels of meaning. So that may make them more 
more prone to, to experience ghosts by misinterpretation of normal things around them. Well, there's a back stairway in the jail that's connected to the governor's house. But back in the 1970s, when they were restoring the jail, they found an inscription on the wall going down the stairs. And the inscription read that I am a vampire and I will feast on your body. If you want to find the way of the path, you need to climb 94 or 95 stairs and you will find a book at the top of the bookshelf. There is a story about the side staircase, which is known as the secret staircase. And there is an inscription on the wall, an inscription about um, vampire ghosts. Now, the story goes is that one of the children, one of the, the warden's children was on his way out to school and it was a van vampire ghost. I mean, we're not talking blood-sucking ghosts. We're, these types of ghosts are ghosts that prey on the weak, the young, the sick, the old. Anyways, and that this child was out to school one day and that this ghost actually possessed the child. This child being young, this child being ill. And he got sicker and sicker. And uh, they were able to tell from little things that he did that this was not normal. This child never really, I mean, he was an active, loving, happy child until one day things switched and that this little poem was written inside staircase. So there are rumors that there is a vampire haunting this jail. They don't know who did it. They don't know how it got there. It was just there. For anyone wishing to have an experience seeing a spirit, the Ottawa Carleton Jail is a place to stay. You're guaranteed that you'll see something, feel something, or hear something there. Coming up on Creepy Canada, in Manotick, Ontario, the mill of his dreams takes the love of his life in a gruesome accident. His fallen bride must roam those halls forever. In 1859, a Canadian entrepreneur opened Watson's Mill, which became the lifeblood of the community. It was the fruition of a dream, but a tragedy ended it all, one horrible day, and began one of the strangest ghost stories in Canadian history. My name is Glenn Shackleton. I'm the director of the Haunted Walk of Ottawa. The spot that we're in today is the Manatick Grist Mill, also known as Watson's Mill. And this is one of our more famous haunted spots in the Ottawa area. Joseph Currier built the mill in 1859 and 1860. They officially opened the mill on Valentine's Day, 1860. And there was the Ottawa Citizen newspaper reported that it was one of the finest mills that they had ever seen in Eastern Canada. The year after the mill was built, Joseph Currier got married to a very young wife. She was half of his age, only 20 years old, a woman by the name of Anna Crosby Currier. Two weeks after they were married, Joseph Currier brought his wife here to visit the place of his business. And as they were conducting business downstairs, they told Anna to be free to wander through the building and have a look at it for herself. March the 11th, 1861 was when the tragedy struck. They came and settled in Ottawa in early March, went on to Manatech to have the first official celebration of their one-year anniversary of a very successful mill. Mrs. Currier, who was 20, and Mr. Currier was 40, were being shown through the mill, and on the second floor, her long hoop skirt got caught in one of the revolving uh, pieces of machinery. She was flung against a very sturdy post killed instantly, and that was the beginning of the end of Mr. Currier. His wife was so much a part of him that when she was killed in the mill, he, he just couldn't take it anymore, and he got out of the mill and apparently never came near the town again. Instead, he went into the carpentry business in Ottawa, where he began to build houses to get over his grief. One of the buildings which he built and spent most of his time on was 24 Sussex Drive, now the home of the Prime Minister of Canada. This is a highly charged story about emotion, raw emotion called love. The love between two people, a man and a woman. Unfortunately, this love would 
and wouldn't extend beyond the grave. She's still there. He may not be. The first reported sighting of the ghost occurred when a fisherman fishing off the dam uh, got caught in a very heavy wind and rainstorm and he sought refuge out of that by crawling in an open basement window in the mill. He was sleeping on the first floor. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by the sounds of loud moaning and weeping. He was absolutely terrified. but he spent the entire night huddled in fear on the first floor. In the morning, he found out that there was no one in the building all night long. He could have only heard the ghost of Ann Courier. Many of the people in the village of Manatick also say that they will see signs of Anne Courier. They see her moving from window to window, looking down upon them. As well, some local children who have been by the museum at night say that they will see a woman dressed in period clothing who stares down from the window on the second floor, down towards them, looking very sad. Sounds occasionally are heard coming from the third floor as well, not only by the staff who work here in the museum, but also by people who happen to be walking by the museum at night. They say they will hear sometimes the sound of crying or sobbing. At other times, they will hear a mournful wailing or other sounds of that nature. There has never been any explanation for these sounds as the museum is closed at night. And on many of these occasions, it was certain that there was no one here. Everyone that comes in knows the story of the dead bride and of um, the mill. And there's a lot of moving equipment that makes noises. There's a lot of uh, sounds that come from the moving water. And a building like that would be creaking all the time. So obviously, it has a bit of an eerie feeling. But sometimes when um, a dramatic uh, death occurs, and, and there's a lot of grief, that, that it's almost as if a building picks up all these vibrations, uh, the same as a record picks up the vibrations of the singers. In a way, it's almost as if someone who is a receiver and highly open to the psychic comes into a place where uh, a traumatic event occurred. Uh, they become almost like the needle and have the thing go around again and happen. It's not necessarily that there's a ghost living in the place. It's just that perhaps the event was seeping, seeped, and recorded into the walls. Some psychics claim that there are male presences as well here in the mill, and that Anne Courier is not the only ghost at Watson's Mill. They say that there are several male presences right here on the third floor. They say that these are hostile, malevolent spirits. Many people will hear banging or footsteps and staff here at the museum also find that heavy equipment has been moved around in the attic when they're absolutely certain the building has been empty. Perhaps these male spirits are the souls of lost workers here at the mill who are trapped still here in the attic. Work in those days, of course, in a mill of this sort would have been very dangerous. It's extremely likely that many would have lost their lives in the process of working here in the mill. The staff has experienced numerous sightings or sounds or even temperature changes in the mill. One employee in particular would hear voices and this led her one day to go down into the basement. She 
heard chains rattling. The temperature dropped, and she fled, rarely to go down there again. Watson's Mill is still run as a museum, so it is a place that anyone can visit. It has a terrific ghost story and quite an interesting history and is well worth a stop. Watson's Mill remains the same as it did the day Anne died. Love has kept Anne chained to the place she died. Anna still awaits the day of freedom to join her husband. And perhaps one day she may. On the next Creepy Canada, ghosts from the War of 1812 in southern Ontario, headless riders and alien encounters in Scugog, Ontario, and much more. Yeah.